Rest and stillness are essential for human flourishing. Yet for me, rest is a practice that's fraught with tensions and competing values. I often value achievement more than rest, and I worry about wasting time instead of being present in time. The more exhausted I am, the less I'm present. But it's hard to fight against the script of family culture or societal values, or the way that my brain is just trained to believe that I can stave off anxiety and stay safe with constant activity. Okay, wow, but maybe I should introduce myself before I keep this confessional going. I'm Kelly. I'm an artist and curator. I call my work contemporary illumination because much of my work brings attention to philosophical or theological ideas. I also just love playing with whatever materials I can get my hands on and making meaning from physical processes. My practice also includes being a curator of an art gallery that's within a church, and I get to be a part of shaping a community of artists that values serious art making and deep wrestling with God. It's high energy and demanding work that I truly love and I'm blessed to do. I've been practicing art seriously for over 20 years, but I only recently decided I'd like to share my meditations and processes on YouTube. I'm trying out new things with every video. Thanks for exploring with me and coming along for the ride. Please like and subscribe to support my work. And don't hesitate to comment below about what you found interesting in this video or if any of the things I talk about resonate with you. In this video, you'll see me working on a study work for my next big project on the Beatitudes. This particular piece is interesting. It's a painting, a collage, and a sculpture all wrapped into one. I'm also going to be working on a commission for a lovely couple in Chicago that's inspired by some of their favorite qualities in a few of my previous paintings, along with song lyrics that are meaningful for them. Finally, I'm also working on various smaller works for a collection I'm going to release in my online shop in early April. Like many creative solopreneurs, I balance a lot of work obligations. And after a big week at the gallery last week, installing a new exhibit and hosting an opening reception, along with my regular teaching obligations and pursuing my own practice, it caught up with me. And the last few days, I've felt totally exhausted. Yet I've noticed something. I keep resisting rest. I feel like I'm supposed to just be able to keep going. But actually, I'm working hard to break unhealthy patterns like that. So this week, I've been taking a little extra time to rest by puttering around in my greenhouse and garden for an hour in the middle of my workday, or spending time going on walks to see what's emerging from the ground as spring approaches. I started to think about stillness and time while I was making this intentional choice to rest. Allowing oneself time to rest and embrace limits is tied to the very first of the Beatitudes, and it prompted me to write a reflection that follows. So grab a cup of something comforting and settle in with me, and let's contemplate together what it means to be poor in spirit and to wait in silence for God. I long for quiet in the deep parts of my soul. What I crave isn't necessarily physical silence. Instead, it's a soul-level stillness, one where there's no anxiety or worry, where the only moment I have to focus on is now. In this quiet place, this still point, as T.S. Eliot called it, I find not just rest, but emptiness. No, I'm not talking about a void, a desolate place where there's nothing. I mean instead to say that there's an expansiveness, a place that is fully open and invites itself to be filled. It's a space that isn't meant to be filled with the cares of my existence, but instead with glory, 
with eternity, with a kind of beauty that lasts forever. This hunger for beauty at the still point of eternity is what drives me to make art or to pursue practices like gardening. Both of these practices require periods of waiting. Art is formed over time, both conceptually and physically. A garden comes to life slowly and plants move through cycles of birth and death, each fruiting in its season before that season inevitably ends. In my studio, the processes of meditating, reading, and writing can all bring me into stillness. And the material processes of making an artifact makes deep connections between an invisible concept and my physical body. My fingers are forming the object. It almost seems like my soul is being made visible during the process of creation, when I'm bringing something forth from a place where there was previously nothing. I imagine that I end up in deep time when I'm making, somehow in the presence of the birth of stars or geologic formations that have existed for billions of years. No, the objects I'm making are very finite, but the process of making them is shaping my very soul, which is an artifact that I believe will persist into eternity. These things are too wonderful for me to actually grasp, but I believe to participate in creation is to be present in the kind of time that's not just a commodity, a thing to be bought and spent and used. This kind of stillness makes space for me to reflect on eternity, what is arguably the most real thing about existence. But when I'm busy, eternity feels like a concept, not something in which I'm currently present. As I've mentioned in my previous videos, I'm starting a new project right now, illuminating the Beatitudes. Even the commitment to pursuing this project was a kind of emptying out a stopping of the continuous whirl of ideas and possibilities to finally rest or to focus on the voice that is telling me to do this particular work. I cleared all the other possibilities off the table and now the table is ready to be set with the richness of this one particular idea. My associative brain is looking for connections between this project and the rest of the world And in my experience, this is one of the most magical parts of the creative process. The artist becomes a vessel for connections between the unseen realm and lived or embodied experience. My project is on the Beatitudes, a set of blessings that Jesus pronounced on people who possess certain qualities like poverty of spirit, grief and meekness, to name just a few. At first blush, these things do not seem like blessings at all, but curses. That's the paradox, and Jesus wants us to wrestle with them the same way the first hearers of the sermon wrestled. These blessings are the first words of his Sermon on the Mount, which is a kind of manifesto for the kingdom of God, a kingdom that exists on its own still point outside of time. The first blessing goes like this, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. I've listened to sermons on this beatitude, and I've been reading a lot about it from various pastors and theologians. It seems really straightforward at first. It's just about being spiritually poor. I'm learning that not all are in agreement here. Some read this as a blessing on those who are economically disadvantaged. Certainly, Jesus addresses and ministers to the poor, but in this verse, he uses a word that comes from the Greek pneuma, which means wind, breath, or spirit. This is an intangible part of us, an unseen piece of our soul. It isn't blessed are the poor, but blessed are the poor in spirit. For this blessed group, there is an acknowledgement of a kind of poverty or emptiness within And that poverty, that posture, carries within itself a capacity for blessing. I've heard poverty of spirit compared to humility, 
but not a false humbling of oneself, an act of making our personality or our needs small and non-existent. No, it's bringing the fullness of who we are into the presence of God and acknowledging that that full person is limited. We have a lack of control and we're in need. Ephraim Radner, who's one of my favorite theologians, talks about creaturehood in complex and beautiful ways. But one of my favorite statements of his is the simplest. Our lives are given and held by God. He's talking about our time, our birth, our death, our resources, our capabilities, the clothes on our back, and the food we eat. Existence is fragile, and we're not as in control as we think we are. In other words, when we're poor in spirit, we recognize that we don't bring anything to the table in terms of controlling our own birth or our own death. If we believe in the intangible part of us, the soul or consciousness, whatever language you want to use to describe it, that part of us that exists tied to a mortal body, yet is somewhere outside of time, before we're born and after we die, and when we're raised again in a new body. What control do we have over this process? Even if we end our earthly life, what control do we have in the face of eternity with that unseen and tangible part of us, our soul? Poverty of spirit is not just an emotional state, but a physical one, an acknowledgement of our limitedness. We are finite creatures bound by time and our mortality makes it virtually impossible to be in the presence of an infinite being. This is why Moses and Isaiah have a particular reaction to finding themselves in the presence of God. It's one of sheer terror. There's a recognition, too, in the Psalms of our position in relation to infinity, to God. Moses says in Psalm 90, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, You are God. You turn mortals back into dust and say, Return, you sons of mankind, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or like a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass that sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it wilts and withers away. Or David in Psalm 39 says, Lord, let me know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you've made my days like hand widths and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Certainly all mankind standing is a mere breath. I really think that this acknowledgement of our mortality is a part of poverty of spirit. But even more than that, this spiritual state of poverty has to do with how we relate to God. The parable of the prodigal son is one of my favorite examples of poverty of spirit that leads to blessing. To be prodigal is to be wasteful. The prodigal son is just the wasteful son. He has committed great sins. He asked for his portion of the inheritance before his father's death, essentially saying to him, I wish you were dead and I only want your blessings, your money. He then recklessly spent all of his father's money and ended up in the most ritually unclean and disgusting place that someone in his culture could find himself, a pigsty. He comes back to the father, covered with filth and shame, but with the posture of true humility. The son doesn't even ask to be taken back as family, just as a servant. This is an example of poverty of spirit and of mourning at his sin. Do you know who in the story does not possess such a quality? The older brother. The one who seemed to do everything right, who stayed and worked hard for his father all the years that his younger brother wasted his inheritance. He thought that he brought a lot to the table, 
and that he deserved a place of honor there. And he did not want to bring his long lost brother back into the family because it would cost him something. He would have to forgive and he would also have to share all that he had with his brother again, a reduced estate. Some people view God like that older brother, sternly disapproving, critical and demanding. I've been there. Through some readings, it seems like Jesus is the father figure, the one who falls on his knees and covers us in embraces and kisses of welcome, tears streaming down his face. I don't think that's wrong, and I don't have time to get into the depths of Trinitarian theology here, but I'm viewing Jesus and God the Father as distinct persons who are part of one being, along with the Holy Spirit, of course. In this story, I see God the Father as, well, the Father, the one embracing his lost son, falling on his knees. Jesus is the older brother that the prodigal should have had. He doesn't stand back with crossed arms, not wanting to share what he has. Jesus shares his inheritance and pays the cost of forgiving the debt because he's fully united with God the Father, who would do anything just to have us come home. Jesus told this story as one of a short collection of parables about lost things, knowing that he would be crucified in order to bring those who are poor in spirit home to a God, their father, who has been waiting, watching for their return every day since they left. Every time I really meditate on this story, I end up in tears, and I don't have a hard time imagining how poverty of spirit leads to blessing. circle back to the idea of quiet stillness to end this meditation. I don't think poverty of spirit is just about seeing our finite qualities rightly or about knowing where we stand in relation to God. I also think about poverty of spirit as a spiritual practice in itself that we can pursue right now, every day, as we embrace stillness and waiting over anxious activity. I don't know about you, but I am not great at waiting. It's a beautiful concept, but in practice it can be excruciating, especially when we're waiting on something really good, like a vacation, or a visit of our best friend that we only see once every few years. And when we're in pain, waiting for healing and relief can feel like an eternity. I know that my tendency is to want to do things to control the outcome, to speed up this uncomfortable process of waiting, or to lessen my discomfort. When I'm constantly moving to get through my pain or even excitement, my brain gets addicted to that motion and can't even be still when the immediate threats or even joys are out of sight. In that habitual hum of mundane activity, I forget my need to wait, to be still in the presence of God. I lose sight of eternity and my relationship with it as a mortal creature. The author of Psalm 131 is talking about waiting as a means of embracing our limits. Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes arrogant, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child resting against his mother. My soul within me is like a weaned child. Israel. Wait for the Lord from this time on and forever. This waiting is a posture an acceptance of what little we bring, and a particular kind of stillness. The still point isn't conjured from nothingness within. The psalmist, a weaned child, is resting against their mother. We are resting on the Lord, not ourselves. It isn't up to us to find all of the answers or to bear the source of contentment and quiet within our bodies. 
Spiritual poverty then is also accepting rest curled into the side of the Lord who provides it. We have laid down our need to control, set aside the great matters of managing our lives to the minute detail with frantic activity. Instead, we rest, we are still, and we take the time to wait. Wait. 